если бы не эти семь лет, которых вы знаете, как бы он отлучен от футбола. Это была бы фигура в мировом футболе, ну я скажу, вслед за Пеле. In 1958, Edward Strelzov was 21 years old and had the world at his feet. As one of the best footballers in the world, and having helped fire the USSR to the World Cup in Sweden, Strelzov was a certified celebrity. On the 25th of May 1958, he was part of the USSR's training camp for the World Cup. On the opening day of the tournament two weeks later, Strelzov wasn't there. Instead, he was serving the beginning of a 12-year sentence in one of the Soviet Union's many gulags. The World Cup was to be dominated by Pele, and Strelzov was left to be forgotten. Born in 1937 in Perovo, an eastern district of Moscow, Edward Strelzov was raised by his mother after his father chose not to return to Moscow following the Second World War, choosing instead to settle in Kiev. Strelzov's interest in football allowed him to escape the realities of his modest upbringing, and he spent his childhood either playing the game or watching his favourite team, Spartak Moscow. His footballing career started early, while his mother worked at the Fraser Cutting Instruments factory, Strelzov became the factory football team's youngest ever player at just 13. Three years later, during a friendly match between Fraser and one of Torpedo Moscow's youth teams, Strelzov impressed the Torpedo coach, who immediately signed him for the club. His professional career with Torpedo began at age 16, in the 1954 season. During this season, he appeared in all 22 league games, scoring four goals and becoming the youngest goal scorer in the history of the Soviet League. The following season, he was the league's top scorer, with 15 goals in 22 matches, and earned himself a call-up to the national side for a friendly against Sweden. While many felt it was too early for the 17-year-old, Strelzov soon shut up any doubters, netting a first-half hat-trick in Stockholm. He scored three more in a friendly against India, and a goal against France meant that by the start of 1956, Strelzov had scored seven goals in four games for the national side. He also had a knack for stepping up when it really mattered. When the 1956 Melbourne Olympics came around, Strelzov had cemented his place in the national team, and was undoubtedly a star of the games. The USSR beat West Germany in the first round, with Strelzov scoring the winner. They then managed to get past Indonesia via replay, setting up a semi-final against the Bulgaria side which had dismantled Great Britain 6-1. With the game goalless by the end of the 90 minutes, it went to extra time. By this stage, the USSR were effectively down to 9 men, with 2 players injured in an era without substitutes. To add insult to injury, the Bulgarians took the lead early in extra time, but Strelzov was the type of player who would seem to stand around and do nothing for the whole game, before popping up with a crucial goal. And in Melbourne he did just that, equalising on the 112th minute before assisting the winner just four minutes later. Bizarrely, Strelzov was dropped for the final, as the USSR coach Gavril Kachalin believed that his strike pairing should play together at club level. With Strelzov's clubmate injured, he was left out of the starting 11 for the final, where the USSR dispatched Yugoslavia 1-0 and secured their first success in international football. At the time, medals were only awarded to those who played in the final, meaning despite his heroics, Strelzov was left without an Olympic medal until he was awarded one posthumously in 2006. The man who took his place, Nikita Simonian, offered Strelzov his medal, and offered Strelzov refused, saying, Nikita, I will win many other trophies. Despite not receiving an Olympic medal, Strelzov and the rest of the squad received the merited Master of Sport degree, ZMS, the highest honour which could be bestowed on a Soviet sportsman. However, the first signs of trouble for Strelzov's career began to appear later in the 1956 season. A natural target for opposition defenders, Strelzov began to amass his own collection of bookings in retribution. The most notable of these came during a league game against Spartak Minsk in Odessa in April 1957, where, provoked by a series of bad challenges, Strelzov was sent off for a two-footed studs-up lunge at an opposition defender. It was a bad challenge, deserving of the red card that he received, but what it was not deserving of was the excessive media coverage which it received at the time. The headline in Sovetsky Sport read, This is not a hero, and several letters were printed, supposedly from members of the proletariat, condemning Strelzov as an example of the evils of Western imperialism. He also had his ZMS withdrawn for the challenge, although this decision was later rescinded. This excessive reaction is perhaps an example of the campaign that was steadily ramping up against Streltsov from the Communist Party. Many believe that the campaign against him began after one encounter in early 1957 at a celebratory reception for the Olympic team in the Kremlin. It was here that Streltsov met the culture minister Yekaterina Furtseva, whose 16-year-old daughter Svetlana Furtseva was besotted with the then 19-year-old Streltsov. When Yekaterina mentioned the prospect of Strelzov's marriage to Svetlana, he replied, I already have a fiancé, and I will not marry her. 
While this may have embarrassed the culture minister, it was the comment he was reportedly heard to have made to a friend later on in the evening that would seal his fate. Depending on which account you believe, Streltsov either told his friend, I would never marry that monkey, or I would rather be hanged than marry such a girl. Either way, from that point on, Streltsov's card was marked. In June 1957, he married his fiancée, and celebrated by scoring 31 goals in 22 games between the 21st of July and the 26th of October. But even for his marriage, halfway through the preparations for the Soviet season, he was criticised by the Department of Soviet Football over the timing of the ceremony. The Communist Party had also marked him as a potential defector due to the interest his performances were attracting from French and Swedish clubs during overseas tours with Torpedo Moscow. Despite the already unfavourable opinion of people in power, Streltsov certainly did not help himself. In late 1957, Streltsov and a teammate, Mr. Leipzig Band Train, where the USSR were set to play a World Cup qualifying playoff against Poland. The railway minister ordered that the train be stopped until Streltsov and his teammate could rejoin the squad, and the incident may have been forgotten, especially considering the fact that Streltsov scored in a 2 0 win, had he not been involved in a brawl with police in January 1958. The brawl saw him spend three days in jail stripped of his ZMS, and he only retained his place in the World Cup squad following a public apology. Preparations for that World Cup were well underway at a training camp in Moscow by May 1958. On the 25th of May, the final day of training, Streltsov, Tatushin and Dogankov left the camp for a party hosted by Edward Karakonov, an army officer recently returned from the Far East. On the way to the party, the men were introduced to two women, Marina Lebedeva, and her friend Tamara Timkina. Most witnesses from the party agree that Marina seduced Streltsov, and they most certainly spent the night together. The next morning, Marina Lebedeva sent a brief letter to the Moscow public prosecutor, reading, On the 25th of May 1958, in a dacha next to the school in the village of Pravda, I was raped by Streltsov Edward. I asked that he be brought to justice. Her friend Timkina wrote a similar letter, accusing Ogonkov. When the news broke, there was pandemonium and Streltsov, Okonkov, and Tatushin were all held at the Petirka jail in Moscow. 100,000 workers of the ZIL factory threatened to march in protest, showing their support of Streltsov, until it was revealed that Streltsov had confessed. On the 27th of May, Streltsov was banned for life from football. The same day, Tim Kina withdrew her accusation, and Okonkov and Tatushin were released from captivity. On the 30th of May, Lebedeva sent another letter to the public prosecutor asking that criminal proceedings against Streltsov be stopped. However, she then had a change of heart, and withdrew her second letter. The following day, the USSR's 21-man World Cup squad was delivered to FIFA, without Streltsov included. On the 24th of July, three days following his 21st birthday, Streltsov was convicted, and sentenced to 12 years hard labour in the Gulag. While the Soviet courts were quick to prosecute Streltsov, his actual guilt remains a mystery. It quickly became apparent that Streltsov only confessed because he was promised that he would keep his World Cup place if he admitted his guilt. Heavy drinking at the party resulted in evidence against Streltsov being confused and contradictory, even from Lebedeva herself. Soviet team coach Gavriel Kachalin claimed shortly before Streltsov's death that influence from high up in the Communist Party dictated that the player was not to be helped. Kachalin said that police told him of First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev's personal involvement, fueled by the grudge held by Yekaterina Furtseva. With Streltsov beyond help, he began a sentence, while the USSR travelled to the World Cup ultimately knocked out 2-0 in the quarter-final by Sweden, the side which Streltsov had scored a first-half hat-trick against on his debut. In the beginning of a sentence, Streltsov held out hope that due to his celebrity status he would be rescued by someone from Moscow. However, as time went on, he began to realise that no such help was forthcoming. In the first camp which he was interned at, Lesnoy, Streltsov was targeted by a thug named Repeynik. When Streltsov ultimately snapped and attacked Repeynik, other prisoners decided that Streltsov was to be killed. After being beaten badly by either an iron bar or the heel of a shoe, Streltsov was moved to another camp, where life was slightly easier and he managed to serve his sentence. While in the Gulag, he would often engage in football matches in order to calm down inmates in times of trouble, and at his new camp he enjoyed much more benefits due to his status as a footballer. Ultimately, Streltsov served five years of his 12-year sentence before his release in 1963. Upon his release, still banned from returning to professional football, Streltsov began playing for ZIL's Department of Technical Supervision in the Factory League. Unsurprisingly, they won all 11 of their games that season, and slowly Streltsov began sneaking into increasingly important games. On one occasion, when authorities attempted to prevent Streltsov from playing, the crowd began to chant his name, ultimately forcing the authorities to let him play in order to prevent any crowd trouble. 
Following this, a petition signed by thousands of factory workers was sent to Leonid Brezhnev, then the first secretary of the Communist Party, asking him to rescind Strelso's suspension, and in October 1964 Brezhnev agreed and sanctioned Strelso's return to football. Now 27, Strelsov had lost a key portion of his career to his ban, but Torpedo were quick to secure his services once again. This decision would prove to be the right one, as Strelsov led Torpedo to their second ever league title, losing just twice in the league that season. He also managed to return to the USSR national side, and in both 1967 and 1968 won the Soviet Player of the Year and added a Soviet Cup medal in 1968 too. As his physical condition worsened later on in his career, Strelsov moved further back to pitch, playing attacking midfielder in his final few seasons. He retired from football in 1970, at the age of just 33, no doubt impacted by the hardship experience that would have been the height of his career. He retired having scored 105 goals in 237 games for Torpedo Moscow, and 25 goals in 38 games for the USSR. Following his retirement, Strelsov obtained his coaching badges and spent the majority of his post-footballing career as manager of the youth team at Torpedo. Strelsov died in 1990 at the age of just 53 from throat cancer reportedly caused by the irradiated food they were served in the Gulag. Following his death, Torpedo Moscow renamed their home ground the Edward Strelsov Stadium in his memory. His face was also minted on a commemorative two-ruble coin in 2010 as part of the Outstanding Sportsman of Russia series. We will never truly know how good Strelsov could have been, having been robbed of what may have been his prime years, and returning a man who was no doubt physically affected by five years of hard labour. But there is little doubt to those familiar with the era that Strelsov may have been the greatest outfield player Russia ever produced, with his goal-scoring exploits earning him the nickname of the Russian Pele. His technical ability and footballing intelligence was second to none, and his pioneering of the backfield pass led to it becoming known in Russia as Strelsov's Pass. Prior to his time in the Gulag, Strelsov scored 48 goals in 89 matches at club level, and 18 goals in 21 matches at international level. Following his return to football, he scored 57 goals in 148 games for Torpedo, and 7 goals in 17 games at international level. The actual events of the night of the 25th of May 1958 remain a mystery to this day. Although the conspiracy persists that Strelsov was simply the target of character assassination, something not uncommon in the Soviet Union at the time, his early death and the disappearance of Marina Lebedeva make it likely that we will never know what happened. There can be no doubt that his untimely prison sentence added to his legend, seen by many in Russia as a martyr, a man who withstood state oppression and emerged triumphant. As I reflect on his career, I think back to his comment to Nikita Simonian following their victory at the Olympic Games. The young Strelsov had the world at his feet, and the future can only have seemed bright. While he did manage to win the Soviet Top League and the Soviet Cup once in his career, he seemed destined for far greater before it was potentially snatched away by a regime that refused to let an individual shine. <laughs>